technology is a solution architect for tecton david has a passion for machine learning infrastructure in particular systems that enable data scientists to spend more time innovating and changing the world changing the world previously david worked at determined ai received his MS in computer science from Stanford University where he focused on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Well, it is so nice to have you back, David Hershey. I want to learn all about recommender systems because I on dethroning Netflix. So, welcome, Mr. Hershey. What's up, dude? Hey, hey, D. I am glad to be here. It's always intimidating following this up. I feel like, uh, you know, there's no way I can keep the entertainment bar so high, but I, I'll do my best. <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Well, I'm glad to have you here. And like I said earlier, this is your second time the first time that you came on i loved it i've got high hopes for the second time and i'm just gonna let you get into it but before we do i also want to intro somebody else that's been hiding in the background ben what's Hello. up man how you doing how's everybody going good can you i'm still waiting yeah. for the day that you come in with the piano and you yeah. support my uke Listen, your ukulele is so much better than my piano, believe it or not. I really I get a little bit of stage fright uh, watching you play. Oh, man. Well, one day. One day. One I day. So, one day. so Ben will be jumping in here and asking questions for David when they come up. Feel free, anyone, to ask questions in the chat. We are going to be, um, yeah, pretty interactive, we could say. So, uh, yeah. Look forward to hearing what you got, David. Feel free to share whatever you need to share right now, and then we'll bring it up on the screen, and Ben and I will drop off until questions come up. All right, here we go. Brad, thank, thank you, everybody. You are, yeah, you are live. Sweet. Uh, I'm super excited to chat, everybody. Um, this is a fun presentation I put together. Uh, as someone who's like worked on a lot of different parts of ML systems in my day, uh, it's fun to just like try to consolidate as much ML and like production ML into as small of a package as possible. So um, anyway, with that said, I I'm going to be talking about how we can build a movie recommendation system. Uh, we're going to use Tekton and Snowflake for that, but a lot of other pieces as well that we'll talk about and weave in. A um, ton of complexity all throughout here. I, I think we can talk forever about a lot of things. So I'm excited to see where this goes, but uh, without further ado, I want to dive in. And I guess before we get into this Rexis, I, I have to tell you a little bit about what Tekton is so that as we get into the various stuff that we're plugging in, you have a bit of a feel for what our tool is. Most everything else we're going to talk about is open source or a $50 billion company or whatever. So uh, I'll start here just to have a good framework. Uh, so Tekton, uh, we call it a feature platform for machine learning. Uh, you've probably in the past associated with us or us with being a feature store, if you've heard that. And the short version of what Tekton does is we really help you take data from all of the places that it lives, uh, turn that data into the features you need for machine learning, and then have a simple way to access that data, uh, both when you're training models and when you're doing serving. So, uh, I guess in a lot of people's world, when you think about feature stores, it's a place where you put features and then access them online and offline. And the real thing that Tekton also kind of dabbles into 
is helping uh, actually manage the transformation logic and the data pipelines that fill up those net feature store. So we'll talk about a few of the different ways that happens. Uh, today, we're going to mostly focus on some transformation stuff in Snowflake, but I just wanted to touch on, uh, you know, when we see Tecton here, it's really going to be a, a tool that is helping us take our raw data, turn it into features, and get it to our models. Uh, so what are we going to do? We're going to build this movie recommendation system. Uh, we're going to plug in Tecton a bunch of spots, but uh, a lot of other pieces I want to touch on. So the thing that I want to step through in particular is actually sort of the evolution of how you can build one of these systems. Um, I think one of the hardest things to do in ML right now is to figure out how you can like incrementally build up a more and more complex system. I think we have a lot of ideas about uh, when I think about movie recommendation system, at least I think about like Netflix, you know, and it's kind of intimidating to think of building back from Netflix's solution. Uh, and so I want to go the other way and, and see how we can sort of incrementally step through from something more simple, something more complex, and then we'll touch on what something really complicated uh, looks like. But hopefully by the time we get there, we'll have a feel for what that looks like. And so uh, I guess tangibly, uh, we're going to go from, I've got a couple of demos up that I'll show you what we're going to work with. So. Uh, First off, please excuse my like terrible UX skills. Uh, I am a lot of things in life, but a website person is, is not one of them. So this is what you get when you ask me for a website demo. Uh, but the first version of the website that we're going to look at is batch recommendations uh, that are pre-computed per user. So what that means is every user, when they sign into our site, is going to see a fixed list of the movies that we think they're going to like. Uh, so if I click around here, I can see, you know, this user, we recommend the Blue Planet and 12 Angry Men, et cetera. And then in the course of this presentation, uh, what we're going to walk through to is getting to this system that actually makes predictions uh, in real time. And so what this is going to take the form of is when some user has just finished watching some movie, we're going to recommend the next movies that they should watch. So uh, when this person just saw Infinity War Part 1, maybe they want to see it or Infinity War Part, War Part 2. Uh, changes per user. And the big thing that's going to be going on behind the scenes here is we're going to be doing uh, real-time ML. So every time I'm clicking these buttons here, we're actually like calling out to a real-time model endpoint and doing that. So uh, we'll unpack this and do it step by step, but this is the journey that we're going to go on today. And I just demoed it. So yeah, let's get into first, like unpacking that first website. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit less like in code for this first one. I just want to show you the components, how that first like or piece came together. And um, we'll go from there. And uh, all this code, by the way, I'm, I'm going to walk through a bunch of stuff. Uh, the code's on GitHub. I'll send out a link in the community after this. So uh, we're going to like dive into model code and serving code and all sorts of stuff. But if you ever want to like take a peek later or uh, refer back to it, uh, I'll share this up. Uh, so let's talk about the first system. Uh, I'm going to walk through sort of like all of the different components that we need to build this system that is going to say, when I log into the website, what are the movies that we think I'm going to like? Uh, and the first thing we have is data that lives in Snowflake. You know, I'll talk about the specific data that I'm building on top of in a second. Uh, but in short, it's data about movies and users, historical ratings of movies. We're going to use Tecton to build features. So um, basically, all of the transformations on top of that raw data we need to do to uh, turn it into whatever our model is going to take. Those features are going to be loaded in to train a model. Uh, I'm actually going to use this like cool deep learning model for this. Uh, we'll talk about the details about that in a second too. Once we do that, we we have this trained model that we can use to basically do batch inference. So uh, batch inference, we're going to get some more features in to basically every day make predictions about what movies I think the user is going to like tomorrow. Uh, those predicted uh, what someone's going to like are going to get loaded back into Snowflake. And then basically we're going to serve a list of the movies that we think someone is going to like the most out to some backend that will 
you know, feed them to actually what happens when you log into the website. So uh, let's like dive into some of these components and explore uh, how I implemented it and what's going on. Uh, so first off, the data, um, two real primary sources of data we're gonna use for this, keeping it simple to start. Uh, first is information about movies. So for each movie, we know its title, the genres it is, when it came out. And the other piece of data we have is basically every time a user has rated a movie. Um, so you know, user 9330 gave us three out of five star rating to some movie. Uh, and this is actually an open source data set. It's called the Movie Lens data set. I also can link that in the message I'll send later. Um, I loaded into Snowflake for doing all this analysis, but uh, it's open source. You can play with it anywhere. Uh, next, we have to build features in Tecton. So uh, I'm actually going to pop over to Tecton for a second and just show you the features I built. Um, Kept it really simple for this demo. I don't want to, again, we're not talking about boiling the ocean. We just want to start with something uh, simple, attractable. And so I've really got two types of features that I built out for uh, this initial pass. The first one, if we remember looking at the raw data in Snowflake, the genre information is kind of hard to parse for like an ML model. It's just this pipe separated string. Uh, and so the first feature I did is basically a feature that takes that string and unpacks it into something more easily read by a machine learning model. So it basically just like one hot encodes is a movie, an action movie, is a movie, an animation movie, that kind of thing, that what genres the movie is. And in practice, what's going on is we have you know data in Snowflake that's getting processed out into those features. All of this is just like uh, SQL query in Snowflake, nothing fancy. We're just saying, does the string contain these different substrings uh, and one hot encoding that out. So uh, really nothing fancy going on here, um, but this is the first feature we built out. And then the other type of feature we have is um, some information about users' historical interactions with different genres. So in this case, it's like, what is the average rating a user has given Western movies in the last, I think I have two years here. So uh, this one, very simple or similar. Uh, it looks at that data, both the ratings data and the genre data, joins them together. And uh, it's actually gonna use Tecton to do some window aggregation. So we can say, hey, in the last two years, what's the average rating a user's given Westerns? And we have one of these features for each of the different genres. So what's the average movie or rating someone's given in action movies and all that stuff. And again, uh, just a SQL query that says, uh, you know, groups by what genre it is and it gives that rating. Uh, so that's what we're working with from the feature perspective. We'll come back to Tecton a little bit when we talk about serving, but uh, those are the features we're gonna work with. Uh, next thing we have is the model itself. So uh, recommendation models, a lot of different approaches here. I'm not gonna dwell on it because we could spend the whole conversation talking about different model selections for uh, model training. People use like matrix factorization and all sorts of stuff. Uh, I actually used this uh, model called TabNet. It's a deep learning model that is specifically built to work well on tabular data. Uh, I've used it for a couple of different things before. I've had good luck with it. Um, normally with tabular data, I, you, know, you can just use like a XGBoost or whatever, but um, I've had success with this. I, I, I find it fun to work with deep learning and I've found it to do better than a lot of the like tree-based methods in a lot of scenarios. So um, this is what we're using. If you're curious about like what the code actually looks like to train this, uh, as I mentioned, I've got this Git repository um, that I'll share out and it has a whole bunch of notebooks, the, the actual notebooks that I used to go train this. So how we get training data from Tecton and the actual code that we use to train the model, uh, that kind of stuff. So all this is available. Again, maybe if we have time for questions at the end, I'm happy to dive into the details of the pieces we don't cover. Um, but just know this is out there if you want to take a peek later. 
Uh, so next step, so we train a model. Next step is basically like actually computing these recommendations on some schedule so that we can, uh, you know, get them to our website. And uh, basically what this is gonna look like is we're gonna pull features from Tecton to score our model. We're gonna pass that into our trained model. Uh, that's gonna output predicted ratings. So uh, just to just pause then that, uh, what that means is the ML model itself, what it's actually in charge of here is predicting the rating that a user is going to give a movie. And so these predicted ratings basically look like this. We have for each user movie combo, the rating that we predict that user will give that movie. Um, and then basically if we like look at the top 50 movies based on how high of a rating we think users will give that movie, uh, that results in recommendations that we can then uh, serve out to our website. And then the last thing we need to do is basically orchestrate this to run at some cadence. Um, reason you want to continuously run this is you can get new movies and, and other things that may, uh, or new users, stuff that you want to get new uh, ratings out for. So, um, and there's all sorts of seasonal stuff. If a new movie has become super popular recently, that might be what we want to recommend. So anyway, we orchestrate this. Uh, this orchestration is one of the few things that you won't find in the repository, but all sorts of tools that you can use to orchestrate uh, model pipelines, uh, Airflow, Kubeflow, pick your favorite, Argo. And then the last piece that I want to talk about is how we actually get those recommendations that we pre-compute out to the website. And for this, I'm actually going to use Tecton. Um, Tecton, you normally, like I mentioned, is a way to get data in sort of real time out to stuff. Um, a lot of times that's machine learning, but in this case, uh, we're just going to basically expose this, uh, these recommendations as an endpoint that our, our backend can consume. So in practice, what that looks like is when I log into the website, uh, the website's going to call out to some backend that I built. I'll show you what that looks like. That backend is going to ask Tecton for the recommendations for some user. Uh, Tecton is going to send back a list of movies that we think they'll like. And then the backend will send that back to our uh, front end so we can actually display the website. And in practice, this is just implemented in code as a Flask service. Uh, all of the services that I build here are Flask just to simplify things as much as possible to get something working. Um, but this service just basically has this recommendations endpoint and it makes a call out to Tecton to get Rex and then sends them back. So uh, that is all that's going on here. And so to zoom back out, you know, now with all of these pieces wired up together, we can every day calculate new recommendations for every user and serve them out to our website. And that results in making this website possible where when you know, some new user comes to our website, we very quickly can serve out to them uh, what movies we recommend they watch. But obviously this has like all sorts of uh, limitations. Uh, if you think about any good recommendation system you've ever interacted with, uh, it is just to what you're recently doing, to what you've experienced, uh, to the mood you're in, uh, what time of day it is, all sorts of stuff. Um, so that's where we're gonna go next is how we can take this and make it uh, slightly more adaptable, slightly more reactive to what we're doing right now. And what that's going to be look, or look like is this system that says, hey, if you just watched some movie, here are other movies you might like. And so it's still going to be customized to the user. We're going to, like, what movies that someone might like is still based on the user's preferences, but it's also based on what they just watched. So we might want to, you know, recommend similar things uh, that they might like. And so let's step through, I guess, the first thing, again, we're going to walk through the architecture of the pieces we want, but this time I'm actually going to uh, go through the implementation in a little bit more detail. So we're going to drill into each of these new components that we need to build to make this possible and, and really figure out like what, what that looks like and how that's possible. Um, before I do that, I, I want to give a little bit of detail about what and how online recommendation systems actually work. Um, and so basically now we basically have this context that I, David Hershey, just watched the movie. 
And online recommendations typically use a three-step process to generate recommendations. Uh, the first is candidate generation. So you can imagine like our task is to pick from all of the movies in the world, uh, what 100 movies maybe I might like next. And uh, that is like the, the big problem is you can't make a prediction for every movie in the world every time someone logs into your website. It's just too much computation. Uh, no matter how fast computers get, it's gonna get, I think it's almost always gonna be impossible to do. And so instead we use this thing called candidate generation to filter down from all of the movies to a more reasonable set of movies uh, that, that we may wanna watch. And there's all sorts of systems that do this. Uh, we'll talk about how I've implemented this in a second, uh, but you can imagine all sorts of things, uh, similar movies, popular movies, that kind of thing could be used to, to filter from the whole list of everything. Uh, then we're actually gonna filter that candidate list uh, to potentially filter out stuff that we know the user's not gonna watch. So uh, for example, we could filter out things that they've recently watched. Uh, we could filter out adult content, stuff like that. And now once we have a filtered list of candidate movies, we're going to use some sort of system to rank those movies, to decide of those candidates, which one will the user like the most, which one will they like the least. And like is a bit of an interesting word there. There's all sorts of goals you might have. You might just want someone to click on it, to buy it, to whatever it may be. Uh, but at whatever our goal is, we're ranking uh, those candidates for that goal. And that is going to result in recommendations coming back to our website. Uh, we'll basically have that ranked list and we'll use that to render our website. Uh, notably, each one of these steps is really dependent on real-time data. And uh, for each of these steps, we're gonna use Tekton as that provider of real-time data to be able to you know, quickly make decisions on all of these steps in our application. So tangibly what that will look like is uh, Tekton will provide uh, some information to candidate generation. And in this case, I'm basically gonna use this concept of nearest neighbors that I'll go into more detail about in a minute. Uh, but it's basically gonna provide the list of the most similar movies to the movies you just watched. It's gonna provide some user based like filtering data to the filtering uh, step. So for example, the list of the recent movies someone's watched will get passed in there. And then the, the biggest task it's going to have is if we need to uh, make predictions with our ML model for uh, what rating a user will give to each of those candidates, Tekton's gonna need to actually produce those features uh, in real time for each one of those candidates. So in practice, this is gonna be like a thousand feature vectors that Tekton needs to produce in a tiny amount of time so that we can pass all that data into our model and make real time predictions. Uh, so let's look at the, the whole system now. And then we'll drill into each of the new components and uh, get into code and actually see like how this comes together. <clears throat> uh, so to start, same basic setup. We have uh, you know, data in Snowflake that is going to pass into Tekton. There's one new table here that I'm going to dive into, which is basically movie correlations. What that is, is how similar uh, or what the most similar movies are to each other movie. Again, we'll use Tekton to build features here on top of this data. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna use like the exact same features this time. I'm gonna, not, not gonna build any new features. I don't need to. Uh, we're gonna start with the exact same set of features. Um, model training is the same. I'm using the same features. I'm actually gonna use the exact same model. I'm not even gonna retrain the model from the one we used for batch. Uh, but the first big difference is that Instead of that model being used for batch inference, we're actually going to need to create an endpoint so that we can do inference in real time. Uh, and then the biggest change is gonna be this recommendations backend where before it was just basically asking for recommendations. Now it has to actually do all three of those steps we laid out before. Candidate generation, filtering, and invoking our model to actually rank uh, the, the possible movies. And uh, this is this is the new system. Um, 
again, the, the big things that we need to figure out are how we're going to calculate these movie correlations, how we're going to make this model endpoint, and then what this more complicated backend is going to look like. So I guess the first thing I want to talk about is actually, I didn't even call it out because this is going to be straightforward, but uh, one thing that does need to happen is we need to get the features that we built uh, available online. So you know, we talked about that genre information of movies and users historical preferences with genre. We need that data available online. Uh, and the reason I didn't even remember to call it out is because doing this in Tekton is actually kind of free. Um, specifically, like, this is the thing that Tekton is meant for. It's the thing that Tekton does. And so when I defined this feature to Tekton, uh, Tekton already kicked off like a whole bunch of jobs that go and take, like calculate this feature and upload it to real-time storage layer. So I really don't need to do anything uh, from the time, like from my batch model that I built to this real-time model uh, to get the data online. Uh, this is the thing that Tekton helps the most with is as soon as I want to access features online, I, I can. So uh, I'm just going to like gloss over this for now because I think this is the easy part and say all of the, the features that we need for our model are just already available. I didn't really do anything. I didn't change anything. Uh, okay, cool. Let's talk about this nearest neighbor thing. I, this is a bit of a, a mystery probably for folks already. So uh, I want to talk about how I am doing candidate generation and how nearest neighbors plays into that. Um, and so let's actually get into code and I'll show you a little bit more about this. So um, first off, before we get into like the, the details, I just want to talk about like what my idea is. So um, my idea for candidates is basically, since we're saying you just watched a movie and what movie might we want to watch next? My idea for candidates is maybe we just look at the, the most similar movies to the movie you just watched. And so then the question is, what does most similar mean? Um, and the way that we calculate most similar in this case is with this cool tool called Annoy uh, that does uh, approximate nearest neighbors. So um, annoying the approximate first, uh, the nearest neighbors part is basically saying it's a tool to compute the most similar stuff to some other thing. And I'll talk about why the approximate is important in a bit. Uh, but uh, thanks to the folks at Spotify who, who built this tool, it's really useful and easy to use. And so now what we need to do is basically define some metric of similarity that we'll use to um, you know, build this nearest neighbors model. And uh, I've taken the most brute force way to do this you can possibly imagine. I basically built a matrix of every user's interaction with every single movie. So on this axis, I've got users. On this access, I've got all of the movies. And there's a number here if the user has given a rating to the movie. And so this is just like a, a pivot table that describes all of the interactions between every user and every movie. And similarity is just basically like how similar these columns are to each other. So how similar movie one and movie 10 are is basically how similar these vertical vectors are to each other. Uh, notably, these are like 19,000 dimensional vectors because I got one row for each of the most active users. And um, from here, we basically just want to like build out this approximate nearest neighbors model. And here's where I'll talk about why approximate is important. Actually computing the nearest neighbor from any one of these vectors to the other 50,000 possibilities is a really expensive operation. Um, if I were to just like compute this exactly, it would take too long for me to be able to do every day. And so approximate nearest neighbors is a, it actually builds out a tree-based model to be able to very quickly guess what the most similar you know, vector is to another one. And in this case, what the most similar movies are to some movie. And so you actually need to like train this like an ML model uh, and save it out. But that's what I've done in this notebook. And I'll show you what I mean by fast in this notebook. So. Um, we'll load that approximate nearest neighbors model that we trained, uh, as well as some, some information about movies so we can print out pretty data. Uh, and then I basically can call this uh, get nearest neighbors by item method of this model that I trained to get the nearest neighbor neighbors to any movie. So 
Uh, what that's going to look like is I want to get the hundreds nearest neighbors to movie one and um, has to do a little bit of loading from disk up front. So it'll take probably five or six seconds for this first one. Uh, but movie one is Toy Story 1. Uh, and you can see that the nearest neighbors are Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3, Monsters, Inc. That all seems to make sense. And uh, this is pretty fast. So if I type in some new movie now, um, we should pretty quickly be able to get out a new set of predictions. And this is actually fast enough that I can um, essentially loop over every single movie in all of existence, compute the 100 nearest neighbors. Uh, and that's what I do down here. I basically have a big for loop that loops over all the movies and computes the nearest neighbors to each one. And then I load that data into Snowflake, actually, so that we can use it for our uh, candidate generation. So I'll pop over to Snowflake, show you uh, what this data actually looks like there. Uh, so now I've got in Snowflake, basically, the nearest neighbors for every single movie is this array of 100 other movies. Uh, and these are what I'm going to actually use for candidate generation. So when I go watch movie 54001, the candidates that I might want to watch next are the 100 most similar movies to it. Uh, and that's it. Again, shout out to the folks at Spotify for making this approximate nearest neighbors thing really simple. Uh, took a, a hard problem and made it a 30 minute problem, which was great. Okay, next step, uh, model endpoint. I'm sure a lot of folks here have spent forever talking about model endpoints. In fact, you've probably evaluated all sorts of open source tools and vendors. Uh, I took the world's most straightforward approach to a model endpoint because uh, I was trying to reduce code complexity for the demo. And so I built another Flask endpoint. Um, what this endpoint does is basically expose an interface, this predict endpoint, that takes in some data and runs it through our trained model. Uh, just as a reminder, I'm using the same exact like tab net model I used for the batch predictions. Um, but if you've spent much time working on uh, prediction endpoints, this should look pretty familiar. We load a trained model and expose this predict function that pre-processes the data and um, makes a prediction. So, Nothing crazy happening here, but uh, just to step through what it actually looks like to invoke this. Um, we basically like have this function now, get predictions that makes a request out to the predict endpoint of our Flask application. Uh, I've got some test data here that we can use to test out this endpoint. Uh, you'll notice these are all of those features that we were looking at in Tecton before. So information about the genre of movies, um, as well as the historical ratings that users has given to different categories. Then we can fire off uh, that data frame to our get predictions function. And uh, what comes back is for each movie in the list, what is the predicted score that we are going to give that movie? So. Uh, this is going to form the foundation of our ranking system. You know, if we sort these by predicted score, now we have a ranked list of what movies we think someone will like. And that is inference, which leaves us with just one thing left to build, which is this whole big online backend that does candidate generation, filtering, and ranking. And um, I want to walk through that. So uh, I've built this again as a Flask application, but I just want to like tease through the components in a notebook so that we can get a feel for what this actually looks like. Um, so I'm going to step through one example of this where for some user, we want to figure out what movies they should watch after they watch Toy Story 1. Uh, and so the first step is candidate generation. And the way the candidate generation is going to work is basically um, calling out to Tecton to get the nearest neighbors. Uh, I guess one thing I didn't explain, so we had that table in Snowflake again that had the list of the nearest neighbors to each movie. Our production system can't make a call out to Snowflake. That'll be too slow. 
And so we've ingested that data again to Tecton so that we can serve it out really quickly. So yeah, when I make this call, it basically makes a request over to Tecton via the internet and uh, grabs back that list of the most similar movies to Toy Story 1. Uh, now we want to filter that to remove bad possibilities. So uh, that's what we're going to do next. And filtering is just what I mentioned before. We want to remove the movies that a user has recently watched from this list. And so again, this makes another call out to Tecton to get a list of the movies that a user has recently watched. Again, we need this data in real time. Tecton's good at data in real time. So uh, this call will, will get us back in a, some handful of milliseconds, the recent movies users watched. Then we can basically just do set subtraction, remove all of the movies that a user has recently watched from the list of candidates and we get back a reduced list of candidates. In this case, it doesn't look like the user had watched any of these other movies recently, so same exact list. And now the last step is ranking. Uh, this is the most complicated one, so I included a diagram. Uh, but what's basically going to come in now is that filtered list of candidates. And the first thing we'll need to do is go get feature vectors for each one of those candidates. So the, the features associated with each one of those could be different. Uh, each movie will have different genres. And, and as you get more complex, there's all sorts of reasons that each individual candidate could have a different set of features associated with it. In practice, what that means is we need to actually go ask Tecton for like, if there's 100 candidates, 100 feature vectors. So um, we're going to need to queue up 100 requests, go ask Tecton for 100 things, put them all together. Uh, we're going to smash that into a data frame so that we can shoot it off to our model endpoint. Uh, that model endpoint is going to do what we were looking at over here, which is basically make a prediction of what score the user will give each one of those movies. Then we rank it. We just do you know, sort by predicted rating, and what comes out is recommendations. So uh, in code, what that's going to look like is this. This is a big gnarly thing, but you'll notice uh, basically, we get feature vectors for uh, each of those movies. We create a data frame. We call get predictions, which invokes the prediction endpoint. And then we sort by predicted rating. Um, if I call this, you'll notice it's going to take a while. Uh, this is like the 100 internet calls I'm making out to Tecton. Uh, here, I've just basically done them serially. So I do them one after the another. Um, I'm actually going to, I'll show you, we can implement a way more efficient client uh, to do this more quickly. Uh, but then what comes out, I've actually printed the data frame that comes out. Um, so the feature data frame that we have, as well as uh, the predictions. So the feature data frame looks like this. It's basically you know user, movie, all of the various features associated with that. As I said, like obviously the genre will vary movie to movie, but all of these features about a user are static because we're doing inference on the same user for each one of these. And then the predictions that come back are number one, Shawshank Redemption, number two, Wally, -E, et cetera. Uh, this is what we're going to use to actually render our, our recommendations. And that's it. So now we've got uh, candidate generation, filtering ranking, uh, uh, if I pile that together into another Flask application, uh, that's what this application looks like. It's big and complicated, but all the same logic here. And the big difference that you'll notice if you look at this code later between this notebook and the application that I actually wrote the, the recommendations back in is I use a whole bunch of distributed like parallelism to do that 100 request to Tecton. So I've built these like asynchronous methods for getting feature vectors. So that instead of making uh, 100 calls one after another, we can make 100 calls all at once to Tecton. And that brings it down from you know taking the second or so it takes in my notebook to taking 100 milliseconds or so in this, uh, this version of the application. And so zooming back, you know, now we've got everything built. We've got uh, nearest neighbors ready. We've got a trained model that is hosted as a model endpoint. 
we've got this backend built. And what that means is now this website is fully functional where when some user watches a movie, uh, we get the recommended next movies for them to watch Planet Earth 2 if you just watch Planet Earth 1, uh, for example. So uh, that's it. I, it this is uh, you know, obviously a lot of complexity that we covered here and I, I, details hidden in all of the cracks. But I think the important thing is we really managed to like limit the scope of what it took to go from a batch system to a real-time system. I hear so much like real-time anxiety in the world of how hard it is. And there's still obviously complexity we haven't tackled. These flask endpoints won't scale. Um, there's, there's more we need to do. But we did manage to limit it to a, a small number of new things we needed to build. Um, and I was able to do it in, in like a day and a half. I think that if you break down these problems into, into bite-sized components, they become a lot more tractable. Uh, cool. So I want to talk about, so we built this first version of a real-time system. Uh, but what does it take to go from that to, uh, to being Netflix, as, as Dee said at the saga at the beginning? And the real big difference that we haven't tackled yet is basically processing real-time data. So right now, we're actioning on data from Snowflake, basically historical data. But if we want to action on more real-time data, that's the big gap that will let us start encroaching on Netflix. And in practice, this looks really similar. Like all of the components we built are generalizable. They'll keep working. The main thing that changes is we just need some mechanism to ingest real-time data so that our, our model that we use to do ranking can use fresh features. Uh, what does that mean? You know, uh, if someone just spent 30 seconds staring at action movies, maybe we are more likely to recommend them action movies. If they just watch the trailer for um, you know, uh, Monsters, Inc. on screen here, then maybe they should be recommended Monsters, Inc. So uh, that's the big step. It's, a, it's an intimidating step for a lot of folks. You have to wire to a completely different set of systems. And in particular for data scientists, it's systems they're never touched before. Kafka or, or databases online, like the application itself. Um, th that said, this is like one of the things that Tekton is really built for is being able to plug into those production systems that are producing data and consume data in real time and make it a little bit or, or a lot really simpler to um, build the data pipelines that process data coming from your application. And so you can plug in your streaming sources to Tekton. You can plug in your, uh, you know, your actual website. You can just send stuff off to Tekton to turn into features. And uh, that's how, how Tekton at least helps bridge this gap where you can now take that next step and uh, start incorporating more real-time data into your model. And that's really the thing that will get you, uh, you know, most people that have built recommendation systems know that the, last 90 seconds of a user's activity is probably the most predictive and useful information you have. So that's really where people want to head. And um, this real-time usage data is the key. Uh, but that's that's it all I wanted to cop or get through today. Just to recap, you know, we went from a system that uh, once a day computes recommendations for a user to something that can predict or compute recommendations in real time, um, but based on batch data. And the next step that we could go through, but I obviously don't have another hour to go through it, is how you would consume real time data to make uh, predictions with fresh data. Uh, and that is it all I wanted to get through today. Uh, it's now is a good time for D to pop back on. Um, I'm going to show one tiny thing before uh, before that, which is uh, not Tekton. Uh, if you're interested, obviously you can reach out. But I'm more interested in the careers thing. If you're looking for a job, we have like sweet jobs available at Tekton. The company's a blast to work for. Uh, we're hiring my job, so you can come talk to D on or on meetups, which is sweet, <laughs> uh, or or other stuff like that. So. Uh, this is my only show is for, is for jobs. If you're interested, please uh, take a look at our careers website. Um, but otherwise, I will I will stop being a, a show and get to the the meetup part. Nice. Uh, I am monitoring the chat for some questions. I imagine Ben has one though. Oh, there he is, just in time. So, what you got for us, Ben? 
Yeah, that was a very cool. Uh, I'm moving over my keyboard, getting the getting the microphone in in position. That was a very cool presentation. Um, yeah, I've been following Tecton for for a long time, and it, it certainly seems like you guys are kind of trying to round out the data ecosystem, which is super cool. I'm curious. Um, for example, you were calculating, you were using Annoy to calculate similarity scores. Um, are there pieces in place to enable serving? of those types of embeddings, for example, if you're getting into movies, if you're getting into audio that's really long and you can't you know, get an embedding for that sample really quickly. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, so I think there's two components that I think about with data in machine learning and it's like production of data and consumption of data. Those are, are and, and to, as much as I can, I try to decouple those because if you don't, brains explode and, and things get confusing. So um, consumption, uh, most feature stores, uh, Tecton obviously included, are pretty good at. Uh, if you shove embeddings into Tecton, uh, we'll, get, we'll happily serve them out to whatever you need, right? Um, so that's a lot of folks will shove, like embed an image, embed audio, embed um, information about documents or users or whatever, and then serve that out and do what you want with it. The other side, consumption, is a way more interesting story. Uh, the pipelines that are creation, sorry, uh, is a way more interesting story. The pipelines that like compute embeddings are pretty gnarly a lot of times, especially compared to like writing SQL on Snowflake. Um, it is doable in Tecton. I have a blog post out there, more chilling, about how you can like uh, use like a hugging face model as a feature that basically like as new data comes in will automatically compute embeddings and store them so you can serve them out. Uh, but as models get more complicated, uh, you know, people have all sorts of tools they need to invoke like big distributed deep learning models. And I think it's it's doable, but I, we're not like purpose built for that yet. A lot of folks I think are spending a lot more time working on how to build those complicated embedding calculation pipelines. Cool. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. I had another question, but actually, Kurt had the exact same question, so we can we can get both at once. Um, he said it was a great presentation. He's curious about how you guys are um, using Tecton to monitor for bias and drift, and conversely, <laughs> or I guess in addition to that, once you detect bias or drift, how Tecton, if it can, can kind of enable you to to retrace back and update your pipelines or retrain your models. Yeah. Uh Sweet question. Uh, it's probably like one of the most common things I get asked when I'm working with folks on Tecton. Um, and I, in general, before I get directed to it, I think like feature stores and the, the things that are orchestrating feature pipelines are like perfectly placed to, to figure this out for you. Um, today, Tecton doesn't have like built in automatic drift detection. Um, we expose a lot of this data, like we have a lot of mechanisms to basically make this data available. And so most folks point external tools at Tecton's feature store, essentially, uh, to be able to look at the data used to train a model, the data that's being served, and to basically profile it and do some consistency checks or drift detection, that kind of thing. Uh, I've seen tools like credit expectations get used or so to SQL get used to, uh, to do that. We are actually planning to build like some native integrations in so that as features are being computed, you don't need to schedule your own profiling jobs. We'll run those. We do have like alerting built in. So if a pipeline fails, we'll alert you. And I think it's a similar mechanism of a pipeline drifts, we can alert you. And you know, then if you wanna hook up uh, from that alert, a job that trains a model that publishes a new model that you know, does that, I think that's the, the route that we'll, we're imagining. But for right now, a lot of people have just built their tooling sort of on top of the abstractions that Tecton provides um, for as long as we don't have something automatically built in. That makes a lot of sense. And I guess kind of leads into another question of how how robust, and it seems like very, but how robust um, are the data pipelines that you can build in Tecton? And what I mean by that is um, you could imagine somebody using a scheduler like Airflow or Prefect that's scheduling jobs and creating data pipelines that may then feed into Tecton or may invoke Tecton jobs. But if you guys are scheduling your own jobs and jobs are code, and for example, I just had another job, like, can I take one pipeline, 
and attach it to another pipeline. And that second pipeline uses great expectations to test the first pipeline and, and, and fails if the data test fails. Is that like a reasonable way to, to combine things? Uh, yeah, it certainly is. And um, I was talking to a product guy about this yesterday, actually. Um, so yeah, Tekton does a lot of like the scheduling uh, and it is as code and, and all that stuff you just mentioned. Um, we are actually like working right now to provide uh, better abstractions around how you can interact with that. So I was actually talking about like, I think we're likely going to be building an airflow operator for Tekton pretty soon. So you can trigger a lot of those more complicated things you have in mind. You know, I think there's two pieces of this that are interesting. Scheduling for feature pipelines is actually like a pretty unique thing um, without trying to get into like a 30 minute conversation. If you don't know how you're scheduling the computation of features, you're really likely to introduce drift between or uh, skew between training and serving. There's like all sorts of stuff that could happen just because a pipeline runs every hour and your data scientist doesn't. So like you actually like need to be aware of scheduling to build good online and offline features. That, so that, that's why we do scheduling, I guess, is the short version. But I think the, the composability, like you mentioned, so that you can trigger a Tekton pipeline that trigger you once it's done, triggers quality monitoring checks and things like that, uh, is definitely the kind of thing that, that folks want to do with Tekton. We have folks doing it, but we're actually like working to expose what I would call a good API for that right now. So uh, you, you, you're hired on our product team. You figured out the kind of stuff that we want to work on. Demetrius, you looked like you had a question. Yeah, so it wasn't a question. It was just I was going to talk some crap to David and say, <laughs> to finish off, Tekton is a lot of things, but it is not a UI generation <laughs> platform because <laughs> the UI that you were showing us is classic. Oh, my God, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I... I um... You know, uh, almost anybody in the world probably could have made a better UI than I did, but that's uh, that's not how my brain works. So uh, yeah. I'm not even sure if I would go as far as to call that a UI, but there is one more question no. <laughs> that is serious, which is um, yeah. how do you support uh, like stream both streaming computations, but also streaming integrations? So native streaming versus like connecting to Kafka or Flink um, to do computations. Right, yeah, uh, good question. So, um, you know, Tekton is mainly like built to, uh, when I think of Tekton standing up a stream processing pipeline, basically like we're gonna listen, stand up a job that listens to a streaming source and processes that data into features and writes it out primarily to like the online feature store so it can be consumed. Uh, what we support today is um, Spark Structure Streaming. That's the, the stream processing engine that is supported in Tekton today. Uh, that could take a few different forms of how those jobs can actually run. But in short, like we can create jobs that consume from either Kafka or Kinesis streams uh, and are sort of constantly running to process data on the stream and, and turn that into features. We've got some nifty tools to help make those more efficient. I've seen a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot when trying to like write all of their feature logic on streaming like with a stream processing engine there's like all sorts of inefficient ways you can do things that result in five hundred thousand dollar bills for the year so we've done a whole bunch of stuff to help optimize and make that a little simpler and make it a little bit less likely you get that five hundred thousand bill at the end of the dollar bill at the end of the year for the infrastructure you use so um but yeah basically we do we build structured stream pipelines uh on top of either copper pieces thanks, thanks so for much. having me on d it's been a pleasure always fun see you later See y'all.